Hola, hello. Uh, my name is Joaquín de la Torre. I am Mexican. I am the regional representative for Latin America and the Caribbean for the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Um, I, tend, I have a tendency to talk too much, so I wrote my speech so that, so that I don't steal valuable time from the panel. Um, the International Fund for Animal Welfare, or IFO, mission is to rescue and protect animals around the world. It was founded in 1969. And today, we, ha we have count 14 country offices and projects in more than 40 countries around the world. We are a pragmatic organization working to transform conservation one animal at a time. Through our main programs, which are animal rescue, wildlife crime, landscape conservation, marine conservation, and community animals. IFO has a history of supporting youth conservationists from diverse backgrounds across the globe, or how I call it, our best investments, uh, through a, a variety of leadership building programs, such as the Emerging Wildlife Conservation Leadership Program, an initiative that, <clears throat> that brings emerging leaders in the wildlife conservation field for capacity building and intense training campaign in development and skills. Or the conservation leadership in the Caribbean, which enables effective regional networking and action to achieve sustainable conservation. Through the CLIC program, our fellows have implemented conservation projects in topics such as wildlife trade, invasive species, mangrove and coral reef conservation and restoration, species recovery, among others. In 2016, IFO also launched the first ever Youth Forum for People and Wildlife, which was aligned with the 17th Conference of the Parties of the Convention on the International Trade in, the Endang in Endangered Species, CITES, where 34 young delegates from 25 different countries participated in skill building workshops and engaged in discussions about conservation and wildlife welfare issues. I would like to, <coughs> this, this is, a picture of all the, our delegates from the Youth Forum. I would like to finish my uh, welcoming message with a message from our Executive Vice President, Mr. Kelvin Ali. IFO is proud to support the participation of young people at the ICCB workshop to highlight the importance of engaging youth in, course, in conservation. We see the involvement and inclusion of young voices as critical to conservation decision making and as a catalyst to build a broader inclusive network of youth committed to conservation and animal protection. Thank you very much. I want to invite you also to follow and engage in our conversation by using the hashtag you the voices for nature. And now I want to transfer the microphone to Dr. Leo Douglas from Columbia University and the Conservation Leadership in the Caribbean Fellowship Program, who will be moderating our first panel, Millennials and Conservation. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Joaquin. First, let me say what a pleasure it is to be here, and I'd just like to thank IFOR for their commitment to developing youth programs and training youth from very diverse backgrounds uh, as leaders and as change agents. I'm so happy to be here sharing the stage today um, with this uh, very talented and amazing group of uh, millennial youth. So I would just like to start by asking each of them to uh, introduce uh, themselves. Um, so good uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Luz Elena Rodriguez. I'm from Colombia, and I was part of the first cohort of the Conservation Leadership Program in the Caribbean CLIC. Okay, good, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alfred Mepkori. I'm a research fellow at Elevant Organization in Kenya. I am currently, I am, I am volunteering at that organization, and I'm so happy to be here. Hi everybody, I'm Melina Sakiyama. I'm from Brazil and I am a founding member and a member of the steering committee of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network. Thank you. Thank you everybody. So just in case you're wondering and if you might be in the wrong room, so if you're here, you're attending the workshop on millennial conservation, how today's youth will shape tomorrow's conservation. Uh, I would like to ask uh, my panel just to share a little bit more about who they are by describing how they have brought their own voices and their own experiences to conservation to create opportunities, issues of advocacy, 
and how to create more effective conservation wherever they have been working in terms of the ethics and culturally sensitive programs. And um, uh, let's start with Luz. Uh, thank you, Leo. So when I went from student to be out there as a professional, I found myself in this terrifying position of what is this? What am I going to do? Because I realized there were a set of skills that I needed if I wanted to survive, especially in this uh, conservation world. So later on, I had this uh, fortune of become one of the fellows of the conservation leadership in the Caribbean program, uh, CLIC. But this was not a regular training. This was a, really, a real thing, like a hands-on thing that led to learn in the field and also make mistakes. So, uh, because let's realize it, we all will make mistakes while we're doing conservation. But what we have to do is move on and learn the lesson and continue with the project. So this was an awesome part about CLIC. Uh, my CLIC group were four people from four different countries throughout the Caribbean. And we decided we were going to run our project with lionfish here in Santa Marta, where I live. But as I was going to be the only one in the ground, we needed a partner for it. So we partnership with this uh, Universidad Jorge Tadeo Lozano, where I graduated from as a marine biologist, and with the head of the lionfish research project. Two students came along and became volunteers for our CLIC project. So, uh, the first thing I had to do was to transfer these skills I was learning in CLIC to them so we were all having the same level of experience or the same learning process, better, uh, as they say it, um, in the field. So we went to the community, uh, started to develop our communication skills. We learned, I learned in CLIC and I transferred to them. And uh, when the click phase finished, we wanted to went on with the project and continue building that relationship that we started with the fishermen. So one of the needs we identified was where the, the fishermen were really afraid to catch the, the fish, as they said, uh, because they, they, get, they get stung very often. So as they said, this thing hurts like hell. Like, we rather to let them be happy, so we are happy as well. So I couldn't disagree with that. And our next step was to try to find an option to uh, find a device that it was already tasted in, the, in Florida that was cheap and that they could build. So we, uh, got, we went through the same process. We, write, we wrote a proposal. Those are things we learned in CLIC. We wrote a proposal and we got one of the marine section small grants from the Society for Conservation and Biology. Thank you very much. And uh, then we went and did the same hands-on process with the fishermen. So here you can see them uh, in these pictures here. You can see them building the device that they were going to use so they could catch the fish uh, in a safer way. Uh, after this, uh, actually last week, we also did an exercise with one of the local restaurants with fishes, with lionfish that they themselves caught. So we can start creating the link between the members within the community, which is our next goal. So our, actually the contribution that I see is like these two girls you see in the middle, the one upper and the one down, these are the students. They are no longer the volunteers for CLIC project. We are now a team that is building capacity in this community to catch lionfish. So the first contribution was that I could transfer these skills. So now we are all able to build partnerships, to make mistakes and learn from it, uh, to build relationships step, step by step with these kind of communities and, and to have good communication skills. And the other contribution is that we were able to give the fishermen another view of an opportunity that could come from this uh, lionfish hunting. 
Thank you. Thank you, Luz. Uh, very amazing ways that you have brought your voice and experiences. And we're going to hear from Alfred. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is, uh, as I said before, Alfred Mepori. I am from, from Kenya. I'm born by a forest in Loita, a forest called Naminenkyo Forest. In English, it's trans translated to be Lost Child Forest. So I started my conservation journey in, in Kenya in the, by that forest because I was born in that forest. And then uh, when I joined university, that is when I got a deeper understanding about the forest and I decided to go back to the community and to work with them. So how I started it is that uh, I got uh, an organization by the name Eleven Voices, which supported me to, uh, to work with the community. And, uh, but before that, I did something for myself. I started uh, by, by going and study a course related to wildlife conservation issues. And then after that, I, I got some knowledge and I was able to, to write, and I started writing articles about the issues that I'm seeing in that forest. And uh, my experience growing up there and threats that elephants are undergoing in that forest, that made me even get got some help from the organization that I, I am working with right now, Elephant Voices, who engaged me to work with uh, my community to try and bring some, some help there. As you can see, when I was in that forest, with those pictures, the picture down there where I'm, step, I'm standing on a, on a carcass of an elephant, those are some of the things that I was experiencing when I was in that bush. So I decided to engage locals. For instance, you, you can see a picture of three, three young, three young men holding a smartphone. To use smartphones to monitor elephants to help me to provide information about elephants in the forest. And they did it very well. Actually, it was so nice and we got a lot of information that we are using to monitor elephants there. And the community are so supporting in terms of, uh, uh, they are so happy that they can use such devices. So the elephant, elephant voices purchased them devices and they use them to monitor elephants and it was so nice for, for us. I also, we also, from that, I form a, a, a youth group an association for youth where we started uh, uh, to negotiate about how, how can we move, how can we change our community as youth and uh, as community youth, as community allies. And from that discussion, that is where I was taking parts myself to encourage them, to, to, uh, to inspire them, to love wildlife. And thereafter, most of them decided to join uh, university and pursue wildlife courses. And now we are together pushing our community to conserve wildlife and to love wildlife and to do so many other things. Also, apart from that, I am also, uh, I also participate with, with uh, conferences and meetings in my country to try to add skills and to share skills to, to other people so that we can spread this gospel and so that we can continue to push conservation work forward. And again, uh, as, I, uh, as you can see, there's a picture there with me near uh, in CITES COP17. I went there as a Kenya alternative representative. That is after I joined a team of Kenya, Kenya, uh, uh, Kenya students who pushed, Kenya, uh, who pushed the burning of 105, 105 tons of ivory, who who, who, which were conf confiscated last year by the Kenya government. That is a message to the world that elephants worth more alive, and they should be protected. So another thing you can see there, they, uh, you can see us at work, at the other picture up there, those are community scouts who are currently working there from uh, another organization that I pushed, that I, uh, I, I encouraged to come and work with us, and now they hired about eight scouts who are helping us to protect that forest, because that forest is very important for my community it's very important for wildlife and it's very important for everybody. So I think we are, I have done a lot and again, uh, I am an active participant in societies. Like in my country, I am a member of when I was at the university because I have not yet graduated. I am hoping to graduate in December, but I am done with my classes. I, I was a member of uh, Masai Mara University Environmental Club, Wildlife Masai Mara, Wildlife Club Masai Mara, Cleaning, the cleaning, 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 cleaning committee. So we are doing a lot actually to try and change people and inspire people and inspire youth to 
participate in this campaign of conserving wildlife. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll go to Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, thank you. So um, I think my journey started like with my dad. So I am a city girl. I'm Brazilian. I grew up in Sao Paulo. You guys know it's 11 million people all living in this massive concrete jungle. But my dad, he came from the Amazon. He was born and he was raised in the middle of the forest in a city called Malves, where it's famous for its guarana. It's like a fruit. And even though like, I was growing in the city, I've always learned from him and he always conveyed this message, even though he's a very quiet guy, um, that the forest and the, the environment and nature is really, really like um, think something to be, uh, to respect, you know? It inspire awe in you. It provides you with everything that you need. So this feeling was always, always very important throughout my childhood. And I think that's where your passion starts, right? And mine it was not with one elephant or a rhino or a giraffe or a plant, but it was with this equilibrium, this dynamic equilibrium of interactions, of relationships that nature is, and this web of like life. And I think. I decided then to pursue a degree in biology in Brazil and I was all very excited because I was going to be together with experts that would teach me and I would learn how all this intrinsic relationship works. And then I got to university and I got a bit frustrated and maybe it was the same frustration as some of you because in the biology department in Brazil everything is in silos. So like the zoologists stay there, the botanists, like the physiologists and everything is very separated. And then all this beauty of web of life, sort of like all everything connected suddenly felt not existing anymore. So, and then I, I saw that there were not that many opportunities for young people, for young researchers. It was like either you do your research and you follow whatever it is that your lab is doing or that's it especially like in, in, in that time in Brazil. So I started to get frustrated and I decided, no, I mean like there's so much we can do. Like biologists inspire people. They have so much knowledge about the nature, about what is going out there. And they don't communicate very well. That's, that, that was my impression. And then I thought that, oh, well maybe if we could communicate a bit better, Maybe then things would move, you know, like if we talk to policymakers, if we explain to them the science that we know in like more simpler language, maybe, you know. And that was my initial passion. That's what I, when I decided to work with like science policy interfaces and trying to bridge this gap between like on ground conservation policy and the, the research. And then I had to leave the country because I, I felt I needed a bit more training, a bit more experience. And so I went to do my postgrad in Japan. And there, like, I was very lucky, I guess, with the timing because the Japanese government was going to host the 10th uh, conference of the parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And it was a very big, very significant conference for international biodiversity policy in general. That's when they adopted Nagoya Protocol and so many other decisions. And the government dedicated a lot of effort and a lot of resources to, to bring young people. And then I was selected to be the Brazilian representative of the International Youth Conference. And there, it was like the first time I saw so many young people like me with similar backgrounds that really wanted to do something that was more active but didn't necessarily know how. And it was such an inspiring, like refreshing atmosphere. And then we, like some of us, we got together and we said, no, the, like now is the time to do something for our, ourselves. I mean, like, what can we do as young people? We should do something. Um, and then a few of us decided to create an international platform, like a global platform for young people to collaborate, to exchange ideas, to check how we can put out our voices out and really fight for what is our right. Because in all these conventions, in all these political spaces, they are discussing how they are going to manage this nature, how they are going to manage these ecosystems for generations to come, for years to come. And we will be the generations that will have to do something, something or deal with the challenges. So we decided to come up with the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, 
which is like a, a platform for young people to collaborate on biodiverse issues, but it's also it's being recognized officially by the CBD Secretariat, so it's the, the International Coordination Platform for Young People in the Convention of Biological Diversity. So we're trying to aggregate the voices of young people around the world to showcase the work that they are doing, because like Alfred and Luz, we, there are many young people doing a lot and we're trying to showcase this. We're trying to bring more opportunities. We're trying to like mobilize young people across the world and like hopefully like to provide for them like um, a bit of help for this journey between like finding your passion, like going through, like driving yourself, going through like many hurdles and into an um, environment that are not necessarily super youth friendly and then try to do something that really matters to you. So, I guess. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you to all of you. Um, so inspiring and um, uh, I'm really just blown away by the work that you all have done, uh, both from the community level to uh, um, under very difficult circumstances to a very global stage. I actually had this as my last question, but it's so relevant to ask it now. Uh, in terms of um, your observations and your experiences um, uh, in terms of human behaviors what would you say are the lessons that you have um, that you'd like to share in terms of how um, conservation works how conservation organizations work uh, in terms of how they have affected or are affected by these issues of culture or ethics um, are there any lessons that that you that stand out that you would like to share anybody can answer nobody in particular Um, I, for me, like, I would like to highlight in this conversation that point of like elitism and like rights and coming from like a developing country, which is a mega diverse one, very rich in biodiversity. We do have a lot of research on the conservation side of it and a lot of activities, but there is still like the cons this feeling that we are still like inexperienced and like the, the the standards are lower than like compared to other countries I feel that like the conservation movement is started as a pretty elitist movement of rich people that wanted to preserve the land so that they could enjoy the view and like um, hunt or things like this especially in North America and I think sometimes this is um, a hurdle this is a challenge for people coming from developing countries, um, especially here, like this conference is amazing and there's so much that we can learn, but if you see the, the price, like the, the amount of money that you have to pay to be here, I mean, this is very difficult for young people, especially from backgrounds like us. So I just wanted to highlight this inequality, I guess. Okay, for me, I find uh, this issue as, uh, so far I have only worked with my community and um, I see that it's so important to, to observe every community culture before you work with them. Because uh, as I work with them, I have noticed that there are things that if you do, they will just hate you and you will expect rebellion. Mm -hmm. So it's always important that whenever you engage a community, you try and learn their culture and their ethics and, their ethics and find a way you can be able to work with them so that you don't find any rebellions or get them feel that what you are doing is against their will. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so important. For me, when I am working with them, because I know what they, are, what, they, what they want and what they don't want, it is so easier and it's so easier to win their trust. And I think that is the most important thing someone can do. Yeah, just let me emphasize that. I've all, um, always been thinking that, you know, organizations, be they universities, we send masters and PhD students all over the world, just dispatch them in great numbers and they know nothing about the cultures or people that they're gonna work with or you know these issues, basic ethics many times. Um, that, that brings uh, also a point that Melina made, uh, saying that how in universities we're trained to think inside the box. <laughs> And we want to study animals' behavior. Sometimes we want to study communities' behavior. But we're never taught to study our own behavior as conservationists. That sometimes uh, 
um, I feel that we believe that we know it all. I mean, we've all been there. That there is someone in our group that we're like, oh my god, this guy. I know. Like, we are not there in the community to change the world from them. We are just there to set a view or something we saw that could benefit them, could not benefit them, benefit them if they don't. So I think something that uh, it's coming out that I'm 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 really excited about is that now how in trainings like for example click we learn about our own behavior our own psych psychology and our own reactions in front of the communities as Alfred says is very important you recognize how your behavior is affecting your work with the community and even your work with other colleagues. Here we have uh, um, funny situations happening that uh, people like me, I, I come from Bogota, and then I come to work with people that uh, it's from the coast. They might have some, some differences and some conflicts, mm -hmm. even within our research team, that might affect our work as conservationists, because people can perceive that. Absolutely. So I think that's something that is starting to being observed, and I'm really glad that it's coming. That's a great point, because many times we assume that because I am Jamaican, I speak for Jamaica. But the fact is that, if I'm going to be honest, in many ways I'm elite. And you know, uh, as I'm going to speak about in the, my presentation in a few minutes, many times I have no idea what people of uh, other stratas of society are thinking and how they, they perceive things. Uh, we have just one minute, but I'd love to take one question. If there's anybody who has a question for our panel um, that they would just like to share. Yes, there's a question. Yes, so I have a question in the chat. I'll repeat it. Um, my name is Lisa. I'm from California. I do environmental conservation and environmental health and advocacy work. Um, so, A, if you give them all the same name, do they see them sort of the same way? So, it's so nice to see so many of you. respecting other people's cultures, are there sometimes, is it sometimes not respectful to bring in technologies in, in that, in different cultural settings? So the, the question is, is it sometimes not respectful to actually bring technology into research settings? If we can only take Alfred first. Sure. Yeah, so far, as you have seen my presentation, I have been using smartphones to engage locals with the conservation. Actually, introducing new things to local communities is always positive, and they always receive it in a very positive way, as long as you introduce them in a way that is, that is good for them. For instance, if you find someone from that particular community who can guide you how to introduce a new things to the community, it's always very important, and they can actually receive it in a very good way. The way you talk with the local communities, that is how they, they, they accept things, but when you talk with them in a way that they, are, they don't understand you, they feel like you are doing something which is not that right, it's always bad. So, but, but things, issues to do with the technology, communities are always very, very positive. Thank you. And just before I thank my panel, just another anecdote on that point. You know, very positive experience. I'd just like to share a negative experience I had, which is completely my fault. I should have known better. So I went into the field and I brought business cards. And I was working with farmers and I just saw that when I gave people my business cards and it was, going back to what I was saying, it then kind of flagged me like, oh my God, you are so like bourgeoisie. Um, and it just separated me as the other. It was ah, the worst thing to do. Fortunately, I was able to learn. I had a, um, advisors and a committee was able to um, talk me through these issues. But so we have to be careful. But um, as Alfred said, you know, it's the way how we introduce these things. So thank you so much uh, for the panel. Just to make sure that everybody knows that between two and uh, sorry four and six o'clock, 
they'll all be at the I4 booth and they'll be available for questions and discussions. So I uh, invite everybody to come and interact with them there. Uh, we're going to go on to our presentations and just like to give a round of applause for our panel. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, thank you everybody. <clears throat> Again, we're moving right into our next section and I'm going to be the first of uh, 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 three presenters. So I'm going to be presenting on millennial uh, um, conservation, a conservation future with millennials. So I'm just going to start by briefly uh, defining and admittedly in a very North American context what we talk about when we're talking about uh, millennials. The norms of people, um, and these are people in their late teens into their early 30s, has changed dramatically over the last uh, uh, few uh, years, a few decades. We are getting married later in general. We live with our parents longer. We have fewer children. And most importantly, or more importantly, we depend on technology much more. We are much more liberal and tolerant, more educated. And we are much more diverse in our styles. And we use style in terms of identification in very unique ways, uh, in ways that are very different from generations that have gone before us. Uh, also, millennials are described in very much as digital citizens. Going back to the question that we just had, in terms of we are really um, tied to electronics in many ways at our core. And it affects the way how we get information, we exchange information. And it also uh, uh, um, affects the way how we even uh, spend our money and even we, um, we give and uh, uh, receive. And also millennials um, are very different in terms of how we spend our time. For example, uh, millennials are most likely to do things what, out of what is described as obligation and much more because we want to be including and for emotive reasons. And a good example of this is to think about um, uh, religion, for example. Uh, many people have said that millennials are much more likely to become nuns and priests. It's been hard to get people to actually get into, into those areas. People want more emotive religious experiences, uh, uh, lively experiences, etc. So just one example in terms of how, as opposed to, I have to do this, out of obligation versus I want to do this because I kind of identify with this. This means something to me uh, in terms of how we perceive programs and uh, products and change, seek to change uh, the world. Millennials have come of age at a time of increased, uh, incredible advances and awareness of biodiversity conservation. And the work of conservation is truly uh, global. Everything from biodiversity hotspots to the UN Red REDD program to SCB um, to the most influential academic, NGO, government, uh, uh, um, and foundations which work uh, for conservation, just uh, three of whom are reflected here. And overwhelmingly, this work is being done in the developing world, places where black and brown people live. That's where we are really focusing our attention to save nature. And these conservation organizations, as the title of um, our conference uh, here in Cartagena suggests, we're doing this in great part because we're focusing on helping create this better tomorrow for biodiversity and people, all people. However, in reality, while the land and communities of people of color are commonly the sites of conservation work, they remain, it remains rare that black and brown people are represented at the international level as full-time staff, senior staff, or on the boards of the largest, most influential conservation organizations. And this has very important implications for how conservation uh, or, or credibility as a movement or public image 
It also biases the type of research that we do, how we interpret those findings, and it perpetuates this colonial uh, uh, nature of conservation. And I speak uh, with this with some amount of authority. I have um, served on the board of the Society for Conservation Biology here. I've uh, been president of Birds Caribbean, a Caribbean-based organization for uh, many years, for four, uh, on, on that board for, uh, for nine years, as president has four years. And the reality of it is that not only is the board overwhelmingly white, they're American, Caribbean. I mean, it's just like unbelievable. Um, and I've been very, very interested in the, these concerns, and I have started to incorporate this into my own work. And recently, I investigated just one aspect of this work by asking 50 randomly selected Jamaican students ages 16 to 18, that just at the cusp of becoming millennials, what they saw when they saw conservation biology uh, and biologists and how they felt about, um, about these things. And I set this within the context of qualitative research interviewing that I was doing in Jamaica related to the hashtag actual living scientist. Now, in case you missed it, in, on February 2nd, herpetologist David Steen tweeted that most Americans could not name a living scientist. I wanted to know much more than if they could name a, a scientist. I wanted to know how Jamaican students felt about scientists. And I selected 17 photos of millennial age uh, uh, um, uh, uh, scientists uh, randomly posted on the hashtag actual living scientist, and I showed this to um, my uh, Jamaican respondents. And as one of the things that I did, I asked them to give me five adjectives to describe the people posted in uh, the, the, the photos. I was very pleased, actually. So one of the things that they said were that were scientists, they were smart, they were dedicated, they were courageous, you know, like, <laughs> kudos to us. But they also said that scientists were weird, crazy, white and alone. And when they said white and alone, they meant celibate, unpartnered, and friendless. And just saying, you know, that's so not me. Anyhow. Um, yeah, but they had very strong, very negative perceptions of what scientists were like. And it really influence whether or not they saw themselves as wanting to be biologists, want to be a part of this global community and actually contributing and being part of what we're doing here. Uh, in reality, they didn't want to see us. And what they saw, even though I was presenting millennials, was, and this is from the two, uh, 1995 film Back to the Future, um, uh, Dr. Emmett uh, Brown, played by um, Christopher Lloyd, the mad scientist in general, that was what they saw. But for me, it also signaled cultural barriers that black and brown um, communities face when somebody like me decides to become a biologist. One of the many barriers that we will face actually before we even step through the door of uh, um, a department that we're going to learn in uh, conservation biology. And uh, therefore, uh, it really has informed me in terms of I've continued to question and think about the experiences of black and brown students and scientists and those especially who are breaking with these uh, um, uh, uh, norms, these social realities of what they, they face, how biologists they will be perceived, and uh, to join our, our ranks. And for this reason, I'm actually at this conference um, uh, launching a call for uh, chapter proposals of black and brown scientists to share their experiences. Because I believe we have no idea um, what uh, uh, underrepresented groups face to become biologists, not to mention their experiences during their time as biologists and how important uh, this can be. And I purport that this is incredibly important for the success of our discipline. I'll just leave it at that point and I'll invite Cynthia to come and uh, speak from here. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to 
this wonderful space that Leo and Ifa have created. I'm so grateful to be here. So I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about youth activists in the 21st century and some of the ways that we are transforming conservation or conceiving of transforming conservation, often in spaces that are not what we associate with conservation. So bear with me. This is related and just um, it'll come together. So this is a map from The Guardian um, kind of showing the percentage of youth um, across the world. And from this, you can see, I don't have a biodiversity hotspot map, but you can see that there are high percentages of people under 30 in areas that hold great amounts of biodiversity and endemism. So Central and Latin America, all of Africa, Southeast Asia, other parts of Asia. So it really matters that we understand the ways in which youth are conceiving nature, but also um, their livelihoods as well as civic engagement. What are the trends in how they're interacting with, with the world? And activism plays a big part in that. So I wanted to insert myself into this narrative as a youth um, in conservation. It's something I've been hesitant about doing. I feel like often in order to be a professional, I have to you know, stand up here and give my data, but I think it's important that we share stories of where we come from, all of us, so that we can better understand um, where we come from. So for myself, I started out always wanting to be a conservation scientist. I wanted to be the Jane Goodall of the orangutans from a very young age. And in seeking out opportunities, I found a lot of great mentorship and worked in Indonesia and Cameroon and the Solomon Islands, um, and it's been amazing. I've had fantastic ex experiences, but as a black woman from the United States, I've often felt alienated in some of the conservation science spaces that I've inhabited, um, conferences, institutions, university departments, and there's always been this, this disconnect that I felt. And this disconnect became extremely stark, particularly in the second year of my master's program at Columbia, New York, um, when a lot of civil unrest was happening in the United States. And this was, this is kind of difficult to talk about because I think we often have this separation in conservation spaces from a lot of the injustices that people face around the world. And one of them in the United States is police brutality. So in 2014, again in the second year of my master's program, um, this is a photo of Eric Gardner and he was murdered by the New York City Police Department. And for me, this was, for me and many other black and brown students on campus, this was an incredible moment of kind of coming to terms with the histories of racism that exists in the United States and other parts of North America and around the world. Um, so the streets of New York, where I'm from, were literally just on fire. Um, and people were protesting. And I found myself, you know, as I was analyzing data on human wildlife conflict from Cameroon, feeling the separation between this privileged space that I was occupying and the livelihoods of people who look like me and who have similar, you know, low income, first generation backgrounds and some of the oppression that we face. And this continued and was preceded by the death of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, Corin Gaines. I mean, these are faces that you can, you know, look into their stories, but it's literally an onslaught living in the United States of people that are being killed because of racism in the United States. And yet I still have to do science and I have to do research, right? So I'm speaking here as both a scientist and an activist. And I think um, what I'm trying to say here is we need to think more about the intersection between those spaces. So after um, the death of Eric Garner in particular, because he was from New York, I felt this, I felt compelled to you know, do something. I had to do something. I felt literally in my body like I have to do something. And so I went on the streets and joined this activist organization called Black Youth Project 100. They're a US-based organization working for black liberation, thinking about racism in the US context, as well as issues around um, LGBTQI people. And through that work, I um, led, organized, and participated in co conferences and protests across the country. Um, 
And this was a completely different space from, you know, working in the field with orangutans in Indonesia or, you know, sitting in my office in the American Museum of Natural History or, you know, being at Columbia University. And it really taught me a lot about how people outside of conservation, particularly black and brown people who are engaged in trying to make the world better, which is the same thing we're trying to do, right, are thinking about conservation science spaces. Um, and activism. And youth activism in particular, this is where technology has been in many ways a positive thing, right? When you think about the Arab Spring, which was a protest um, that started by social media. Um, so we're all connected, right? And we're connected in this conversation about our livelihoods, again, civic engagement, and the environment. And a great example of that is Standing Rock. So I'm not sure how many of you, this is a North American example of uh, activists, indigenous activists and just people um, who came together to protest an oil pipeline that was going through some indigenous land up north in North and South Dakota. And I wanted to share one of the, the some of the words from a youth activist um, who led the Indigenous Youth Council. And she talks about how I want to have kids, but I don't want to have kids if I can't guarantee for them the simple freedoms that were afforded to me. She's thinking about the next generation. We're responsible. We are responsible, us here right now, all the babies that have been born and all the children that will be coming. And then there's this sense of, of urgency and anger. We're taking back our land. We're taking back our languages. We're taking back our sacred resources. Um, and you're not allowed to be in charge anymore. And that, that last line, you're not allowed to be in charge anymore, has been part of youth activism for as long as I have studied youth activism, I think, from the beginning of time, right? And this also was um, demonstrated in the Fees Must Fall protests in South Africa, where youth activists were coming together around uh, really high tuition fees that were prohibitive, especially from people from you know, low income backgrounds, as well as a curriculum that didn't represent African knowledges and ways of experiencing the world. And they were talking about science. This one um, activist said, science as a whole is a product of Western modernity and the whole thing should be scratched off. Western modernity is the problem that decolonization um, directly deals with. So we're going to think about our perspective and center that in the work that we do. And it's important that we, in these conservation science spaces, listen to these voices, right? Because this concerns us. So we're here at this conference and we all have the same sense of urgency, right? Six math extinction, biodiversity depletion, habitat degradation. We're also, as you saw front and center in the opening plenary, talking about diversity and conservation. People also are having issues, scientists, even privileged scientists are having issues in terms of the governments, you know, not valuing their science or not funding their science and they're fighting that as well as people that are literally fighting for their lives um, from environmental injustice around the world, though we're not necessarily having those conversations in these spaces as this conference. Um, and when thinking about all of this and pulling it all together, this rise in like, let's include more people, we need diversity, it's important, but it's not enough. It's not enough. And this is a quote from uh, another youth activist, but also a scholar, a sociologist, Zoe Zimudzi, talking about how it's not enough to include us in the, con in the conversation, conservation conversation. We also need to think about how we're transforming these spaces based off of the experiences that marginalized identities have had in this space. And this is something that you know youth activists really have a lot that we can learn from on. Um, and there's this term that you may have heard before, it comes up a lot in youth activist space, decolonization. I do not have time to go into that thoroughly. Um, but there's a lot of a whole history of scholarship on this. And decolonization, there's this quote here, you can read it or you cannot read it, but primarily it's concerned with changing the order of things, right? It's a complete disruption, it's uncomfortable. And when we think about that in conservation, we're talking about questioning the origin. So Melina talked about that earlier, thinking about who formed conservation in terms of um, normative conservation. It's unlearning some of the things that we are, that's inscribed into our curriculum about certain people, you know, racism, uh, sexism, all these things that are silently there. Recovering indigenous knowledge that's been lost. Redistributing power to people that haven't had access to it before. It's about thinking about praxis, so how we operate in our daily lives and are we operating in just ways. 
So I want to end uh, with these questions. We won't have time to answer them, but it's just some food for thought. You can take a picture, or I'm happy to send this slide around. So as an activist, this is the first question that I, I have for you all. You know, what ideologies, even on display at this conference, might perpetuate colonial, racist, patriarchal, ableist understandings of conservation? How are youth right now creating new spaces that contest some of these ways of knowing and experiencing nature? Um, with this political unrest across the world, how um, important will these spaces be in transforming conservation? And what role can established conservationists play in engaging and fostering these spaces so that we don't lose out and we do something new and we actually think about conservation success as being very much related to people's lives, especially marginalized people's lives. So with that, I'd like to leave it and um, introduce Eleanor, my mentor and esteemed colleague. So thank you, Cynthia. That was um, terrific and a really terrific group of people. Um, I just have to admit I'm not a millennial, <coughs> in case you hadn't noticed. But I am here as a white cis woman who has experienced bias um, because of the gender that I identify with. And I'm also a leader in the field of conservation and I have a role to play in addressing these issues that have been brought up today. Uh, really quickly, I was frequently the only woman on any conservation panel and I was often brought in at the last minute where I got on campus and there was stuff all over the campus with, that was showing and talking about the, the panel with the pictures of the men. And then if I was lucky, my name got scribbled onto that um, thing at the last minute and they all had printed things and I might have to just write my name on the back of an envelope and put it up on the, um, on the panel. When I entered the field of conservation, almost everybody was independently wealthy. I was paid $300 a month, and I was the only person in my office who was actually trying to live off of that amount of money. And so lots of things have changed, and a lot of things I dealt with as someone who um, was underrepresented at the time, but certainly not anything like um, I never feared for my life. Um, I never walked down the street and felt like people walked across the other side of the street because of who I was or what my skin color was and so many different things that I don't have to deal with that I can actually help to overcome as a leader in the field of conservation. I'm hugely passionate about the issues of inclusion and equity and diversity and try to incorporate thought about these issues across everything that I do. Ultimately, I think all of us need to ensure that these issues of equity, inclusion and diversity are mainstreamed across everything that we do so that it's such that we don't even have to think about it. That's my dream. Um, so people who are established scientists like myself, who, who have leadership roles in places like the Society for Conservation Biology, we can play really important roles in shifting the norm towards equity and inclusion and clearly identifying barriers. First and foremost, we need to recognize that there's a problem. We need to understand the history of conservation institutions in perpetuating these problems. We need to not feel defensive about that. We need to feel uncomfortable. Uh, Cynthia just said in decolonization, we're all gonna feel uncomfortable. We're gonna, need, we're gonna need to recognize that we make mistakes and be open to learning how to not make those mistakes again. Um, <clears throat> and we don't need to wait to hear from underrepresented people regarding these problems. We can be voices for articulating the problems and for identifying solutions. And in particular, as leaders, we can also help to ensure that those solutions are implemented. So people like Leo and Cynthia and the wonderful millennials we had up on stage are phenomenal researchers. We should engage with them on the quality of their research and what they are doing rather than engaging with them on the basis of their skin color and appreciating the fact that they're in the room because they're black. Too often I've seen people thoughtfully welcome underrepresented individuals, <laughs> but really only engage with those individuals because they're black and not as experts in their field. When we see people from groups underrepresented in conservation, we should also not immediately assume that they want to be advocates for diversity, equity, and inclusion. When we're choosing panelists for, or people for fellowships or plenary speakers or panelists or to represent something on our website, we should consider representation and inclusion. When we're thinking about how to be part of an organization, an event, we shouldn't assume that people have credit cards, that they have access to money, that they have the resources that many of us have. When we're serving as mentors, we should understand that what motivates your student 
uh, understand what motivates your student. It makes space for exploring reasons why they're not doing what you did when you were growing up. They may not have the leisure to be able to spend the summer working for free in another country. They may be supporting their family and not telling you that. And that may stop them from being able to, to do some of the things that are the norm in our field. Um, we should be sure that, not only, that we don't only offer uh, unpaid internships in our organizations or that our starting jobs <coughs> are starting level jobs without health benefits. Don't send students to work in communities when the students don't speak the language or have a sense for the culture. You are responsible for that, not just your students. You are responsible to ensure that your student is ready to contribute and benefit from interacting with that community and not just extract information or ideas from that community. So I have other things, but I realize that we're a little bit late, so I just wanted to say thank you all for coming. We all have a role to play. We all have lifelong work learning in these issues. And thank you to IFA and everyone for organizing this event. Just to echo that again, thank you everybody for coming. Thanks so much to IFA for their contributions. Um, uh, thanks to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Thanks to the fellows for sharing your experiences, real world experiences I might add, for your journeys to access, challenge, create opportunities for others in where, places that you work. And also thanks for sharing about the challenges that it will mean to transform conservation from where we are now to where we want to be. Thank you all for coming and just a reminder that between Four and six o'clock, we'll be at the IFA booth and we'll be very interested in having you come and um, uh, interact with us. If you would like to leave your information with us, I'm going to be circulating just uh, by the door outside a notebook and um, but you can share your contact information with us. Thanks again, everybody. And feel, please feel free if there's anything left in terms of refreshments to, to grab those on your way out. Thanks again. And before you go, please don't leave without an IFO bag and a beautiful keychain that we brought for you. You're going to see the bags now. <laughs>